Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here to talk a little bit about prosthetic joint infections. It's quite a broad topic. Um, this was one of the first cases that was referred to me as a joint medical trust hospital around eight months ago. Um, I, was, I had re recently returned from UK. Um, and uh, I was ki very kindly, ref this one, one of my friends very kindly referred this patient to me. She was a 65 year old rheumatoid, diabetic. She had this uh, replacement almost 10 years ago and uh, she presented with systemic symptoms for the previous three months. So this is one of the nightmarish cases for anyone. Uh, when uh, it didn't improve any further, I did an arthroscopy to find out if there was any organism there, so it was pus pouring out. So it is cases like these which made Sir John Chandley say that this is probably one of the saddest of all complications. It's sad because it seriously limits the success of any subsequent operations. So we all know the risk factors for prosthetic joint infections. Patients such as immuno immunocompromised patients, uh, if you take uh, three hours for a joint replacement, if your theater facilities are not up to scratch, these are all predisposing factors for joint replacements. We all uh, very well know how the acute joints present presence with pain, erythema, sinus, and all that. Those cases are easy to diagnose. It is the cases with chronic infections which are the difficult ones to diagnose. The typical feature in chronic infections is the nature of the pain. It's non-mechanical pain. The patients could get pain even when they are at rest. Uh, they get this slight night pain. The joint may feel slightly warm. The other typical feature is that, you know, if you have any patient with loosening, which presents within 10 years of replacement, you need to think about a loosening. Our general tendency is to blame the patient saying that he has walked too far to make the joint loose or if it's been done by some other surgeon we blame the surgeon for putting the alignment wrong but many times it may be that the joint may be infected. Uh, coming to the investigations, white cell count is a pretty useless test as far as chronic infections are concerned. A combination of CRP and ESR, that is probably the best test as far as investigation from a blood point of view is concerned. If you have a patient with a CRP of less than 10 and a ESR of less than 30, you can pretty much virtually rule out a deep infection. X-rays are useful like the case you have seen already. Uh, bone scan is useful, but the only problem is that it could be positive for a year or two after joint replacements. Aspiration is pretty useful, but you have to do it in selective cases because if you do aspiration in every case which is going for a revision, you will have a high false positive raised. So you should, uh, the Vancouver group, uh, which is the same group who did the work on periprosthetic fractures and all that, they have done a lot of research into joint replacement and infections. They suggest that once we should do uh, aspiration only in selected cases with raised CRP and ESR to avoid these false positives. Also, it's important to stop any antibiotics beforehand. At least two weeks before the uh, aspiration, one should stop the antibiotics. And when you do biopsy, uh, biopsy is very useful during the operation. You should do it before the antibiotics are given. You should take at least five specimens using separate knives and forceps. And uh, one should specifically ask for extended cultures. So these are the common bacteria. Coagulase negative staphylococcus predominates in these infections. Um, I'm sure some of you may have heard about this race for surface. Whenever a prosthesis is implanted, whether it's a prosthesis, a, a nail or a screw or whatever, whenever a foreign body is implanted in the body, there is a race between the body cells and the bacteria which found the way into the bloodstream. So this is called the race for the surface. Whoever gets to the surface of the foreign material first wins the race. So if the bacteria gets to the foreign, foreign body, say the prosthesis this time, it gets attached to, that attached to the surface. The bacteria, as you can see here, forms that little slimy layer called the glycocalyx, which is made of polysaccharide. Once it forms that layer, it is impossible for any sort of antibiotic to penetrate that layer. So this is the basic science behind a two-stage revision arthroplasty. Once the bacteria fo have formed this neat little shell, it is absolutely impossible to er eradicate the infection without removing that, the substrate on which they are sitting, which is the prosthesis. So this is the basic science behind uh, a two-stage revision. Generally, this happens after a month or so after the implant has been implanted. Um, as far as classifications go, this is the most one, uh, most practical one which I have found. This is the same guy, Gastilo and Sukayama. The most important ones are the first two ones. It is the one month one should concentrate on. If any infection is less than one month, we can actually salvage the joint by doing a thorough debridement, changing the modular components, uh, keeping the patient on long-term antibiotics. Anything more than a month, generally, you have to do a two-stage revision. So, like I said, for the early infection, these are the treatment options. You can do a debridement, implant retention. 
you can change the modular component. So in this heap, if you are doing a revision, uh, you're doing a, doing a um, debridement, you should change the head, which is a modular component. You should change the liner there, which is also modular. So you are trying to reduce uh, the bacterial count and all the bacteria which have adhered to the surface of the of the of the of these modular components. So for uh, uh, late infections, the treatment options are uh, joint preserving and joint sacrificing. Examination is about classification, so you should think about classifying these, uh, you know, all, all the treatment options. So the joint preserving options, you can have either a two-stage exchange or a one-stage exchange. Uh, two-stage exchange is the gold standard. When I mean two-stage, what I mean is you do a debridement in the first stage, put in a spacer, antibiotic loaded spacer to start with, and once the infection has cleared, you put in the definitive implant, as you can see in this case. This is a knee which is uh, with, a, with a hot spot on the bone scan. Uh, a cement spacer is in there, and that's the, uh, that's the knee at the end of the revision. For uh, joint sacrificing options are concerned, knee fusion is an option. But knee fusion is a pretty, pretty um, you know, patients don't uh, like that operation very much because it's quite difficult to walk around with a fused knee. Uh, in the in case of hip, generally fusion is not possible after a hip replacement. You go for a hip excision arthroplasty, or otherwise called as a girdle stone arthroplasty. Um, train is commonly asked, what sort of antibiotics can you can you use in a cement? Any heat stable antibiotic could be used. So all these antibiotics have been tried, but the most commonly used ones are vancomycin and gentamicin. So we'll just look at a few case, case examples. This was the case of an infected Birmingham, Birmingham hip resurfacing. Uh, two months post surgery, he presented with a pouring sinus. So this was treated with an antibiotic loaded uh, cement into the into the acetabulum. Ideally, I would have liked to, to see a bit of cement in the canal as well, but in this case, uh, we did not put that in. Uh, so after six weeks of intravenous antibiotics, once the CRP and DSR were normal, we revised it to a hybrid total hip replacement using antibiotic loaded acrylic cement. This is another case, uh, this was a 65 year old lady, it's a bit more difficult to diagnose because she was three years post surgery, uh, had uh, no problems with wound healing or anything, uh, she presented just with painful groin and uh, she had slightly raised the CRP and DSR but the bone scan was hot, uh, so we uh, aspirated and uh, she was positive for uh, Staphylococcus aureus, so we did a, a two stage revision on her, you can see that uh, there is a long stem spacer in place. Uh, we put, put a long line in, gave her appropriate antibiotics based on the intro biopsy and uh, did a second stage around uh, three months later, uh, following with the infection cured completely. This case was a bit more tricky because this lady came to me, um, initially I saw her before this fracture happened, she was, she's 85, quite frail, she was on multiple medications for ma various medical problems. Uh, she has had a history of wound infection prior to this. So when, when she came to me, the, it was clear that she needed a revision, but she declined the revision initially. Then she came to us, uh, came to us back again once it had fractured. So it presents quite a challenging problem because you have got a problem, combination of uh, poor bone stroke, uh, infection, and a fracture. So in this case, um, we aspirated to start with. She, was, uh, she had Staphylococcus aureus sensitive to augmentin. So in this particular case, I felt that probably she is too old and if I do her a two-stage revision, she may not withstand that. So uh, we dis after having discussion, after having a long discussion with her and the family, we decided to go ahead with a single-stage revision because we felt that it's probably uh, safer for her. So uh, we, in this case, we knew the infecting organism, the soft tissues were okay, and uh, frailty of the patient. These were the reasons why we did a single-stage revision. So these are uh, trabecular metal augments. These are uh, made of porous tantalum, which is which is actually uh, helps bone to grow into the component, and also it provides immediate stability. So we did a single stage revision and put her on long term suppressive antibiotics, and uh, she has been uh, she has had no significant pain in the hip as such. Uh, these days one cannot get away without mentioning metal on metal uh, articulation. Um, many, many cases of metal on metal articulations present with pictures similar to infection. But many of these cases, as this report, as this case we reported uh, in last September J Journal of Arthroplasty, uh, it, uh, the aspirate, aspirate could look typically like pus, but it is not actually pus, it's a pseudo tumor. So if you do all the preoperative investigations well, you may not see, um, you may not, it may not be an infection, that way you can avoid a two stage arthroplasty. So these are the main points. CRP of less than 10 years or of less than 30, you can virtually rule out an infection. Um, take uh, bone scan can be positive up to a year after total hip and total, total uh, knee replacement. The rest of it we have mentioned. 
Um, so this case, we had extensive bond laws. We decided to go ahead with a two-stage revision. We did, uh, th there was extensive bond laws anteriorly in the f and posteriorly in the FEMA. So we decided to go ahead and do a trabecular metal augment and a revision. Uh, and uh, her infection has been cleared. I saw her actually last week. She is doing very well. So to look back at Chandli's statement, it is quite a sad, it's the saddest of all complications. Uh, it is sad, but these days, if you carefully plan the operation, you can achieve a cure rate in more than 80 to 90% of the cases. Thank you.